Greetings all, welcome to Everything Borrowed, where we sit down to share stories and have conversations with entrepreneurs to artists and everyone in between. Today's episode is powered by Blake's Hard Cider, 100% fresh pressed, all natural and gluten free, straight from our family's 75 year old farm in Southeast Michigan. Find us in your local grocer or have Blake's direct ship to your home by visiting blakestore.com. Use promo code Everything Borrowed to receive 10% off your first order. Must be 21 years of age, please enjoy mindfully. What's up, guys? Our guest today is the nicest guy in the beer industry, my dear friend, Dave Engbers, co-founder and president of Founders Brewing Company. In today's episode, we discuss Founders' journey from a struggling craft brewery in Grand Rapids that was selling off equipment just to make payroll to their historic ascent as one of the most relevant names in beer today. Dave talks us through his college days drinking from kegs with his fellow co-founder, Mike Stevens, to his Tommy Boy days on the road just trying to sell suds. Dave is a dear friend, a mentor, and an absolute example of how to attain success gracefully. I hope you guys enjoy. Cheers. So thanks for coming out. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, You know, so obviously, you know, the show, we we interview entrepreneurs, artists, a few politicians, but, you know, and a lot of people- get into politics? Yeah. Well, just locally, we've had some people who are doing some cool things around. We had them on. Uh Um, So we try to kind of, I know it's polarizing, but we try to do- you know, we're middle of the road, you know, sure. you know, reasonable people. So we wanted to just, you know, when other reasonable people start speaking, even on politics, we wanted to, you know, hear them out. Sure. Um, but anyways, you know, we're, we're getting in. We got a, a kind of a lineup of people in the industry. And, um, you know, you're kind of, you know, one of the rock stars of the craft beer Come industry. On. Well, um, you know, people, t- people tell me this. And, you know, as you look from afar, um, you know, you kind of are one of the big figureheads in the craft beer industry. And, you know, I know your story kind of intimately. We have a lot of mutual friends. You and I have become friends. But for those who, um, you know, don't know the founder's story, um, you know, how'd you get into this world how'd of craft I, beer? How'd I get into this Yeah, how, how, did, how did it start? Because I actually saw pictures of you when you first started. Yeah. I mean, you were a little, you know, you were like a suit and tie. You know, you, look, you looked more, I mean, you are free now. You look yeah. free you know, you, you know, the craft beer industry has liberated you, but I mean, were you always going to do this? How did it start? So, yeah, I, I get that question a lot. How'd you get into this? You know, and you know, the, the short answer is just, you know, live your dream. Um, and I, I always have to tell the story. I, there's a preface that, um, you know, I'm the youngest of four kids. Mm-hmm. So my, my folks had four children. I've got two older brothers who are like, 10 and uh, eight years older than me. Um, and then my sister and I came along, you know, a little later. Um, so my parents really kind of raised two families. So my, my two oldest brothers, my parents were like super strict, trying to, mm-hmm. you know, they were just trying to figure out how to be parents. Uh, my sister and I, my parents were tired of parenting mm-hmm. you know we had much longer leashes and uh, my sister was just really smart self-managed and like here I'm like the last kid and my parents are just like do whatever <laughs> so um, I now I wish and I've, I've had this I can joke with my parents that I wish I had a little bit more guidance as a child but um, <laughs> you know at the age of 15 you know I'm I'm nicking beers off my dad's back porch and you know I'm just trying experimenting doing things that you're not supposed to do or i think you're i think supposed to do um and my dad really was not a big beer drinker but um anyway i started experimenting stealing some beers and then um you know doing some other things as well and um when i was 17 years old and you know i really didn't know my oldest brother my oldest brother had moved out to california when i was what was the age difference he was about 10 years older, so he was, you know, I think now I look back and I'm thinking, you know, he's still in his 20s or something. Right. Like that. But, um, you know, here I am, 16, 17 years old, and I really didn't know him. When, when he took off to go to California, like, we lost contact with him for a few years, and mm-hmm. he lived on a commune. I mean, he really went into the hip. He went full, he went full he went West full Coast. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyway, he, he went out there, and my parents were going on spring break, and said you know hey you know we're going to florida blah 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 and i'm like i want to get to know my oldest brother so i flew out to san francisco and he picked me up and um you know he goes you know do you drink and i'm like yeah (laughs) yeah do you smoke i'm like yeah i can smoke and uh anyway we went right to the store 
and uh, picked up a couple bottles of Mendocino County Red Tail Ale. And I'd never seen I'd never seen a big bottle of beer before. I mean, it was a twenty two ouncer, and you know, I'm, bombers. I'm, yeah, I'm used to yeah. seeing you know bottle twelve ounce bottles and yeah. cans. So right. all of a sudden it was new, and I'm hanging out with my long haired brother, and you know, we're smoking California weed. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is much different. Yeah, and the joints, holy shit, the joints were like as thick as my pinky. <laughs> I'm like, Whoa, I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, anyway. So I'm drinking, you know, I get to drink this beer that looked different. It tasted different. It just had so much flavor compared to everything I'd experienced before. And um, anyway, that was kind of my intro to craft beer. And Mendocino know, County Red Ale. Mendocino County Red Tail Ale. Unfortunately, they, uh, they, uh, they went bankrupt a couple of years ago. But um, anyway, that was a beer that changed my life, you know, and it was a trip that changed my life. That's awesome. And... Um, about two years later, I think I was 18, 19 years old, my parents bought me my first home brew kit. And uh, I always like to say, you know, homage to my mom because my mom's a great cook. So, um, like, f- flavor and entertaining, just, like, you know, being in the moment mm-hmm. and, like, surrounding yourself with people and conversations mm-hmm. uh, has always been a big part of our family. And so, um, you know, my parents really kind of encouraged me and they said we know you like beer you know or love beer so why don't you make your own so I started home brewing a little bit and uh you know then I went to college college was just like you know no rules right I had no idea what I was what I wanted to do with where'd my you life. go to college I went to Hope College in uh, Holland Michigan and um very conservative and quite I, honestly I thought I don't know if I'm gonna you know one I didn't even know if I was gonna go to college right. I was like I don't know just gonna back then I was listening to Grateful Dead you know in summers I'd go on tour and I would just, you follow him oh uh, just you know I wasn't like a deadhead but you know I'd follow him for like four or five concerts in a row when they were in the Midwest That's I'd, still pretty committed yeah yeah I stunk I know that <laughs> I mean, it's like I could go I could go a couple of weeks without a shower yeah um anyway but that was fun but uh it was those times that I wish I maybe had a little bit more guidance in my life. Mm-hmm. But um, college. But do, but do you though? Y- y- your life turned out fucking amazing. Yeah. You know, so like, you know, I don't, I don't think maybe you wanted it, but you probably wouldn't be here if you had well, it. Well, I think that's kind of what <laughs> defines all of us is, you know, the times when you do stumble or right. you have challenges. I mean, going back and looking, I mean, we've built a great brewery and great culture and all that stuff. But, you know, I still kind of look back and, now that we've gotten to a different spot and the business is doing really well, some of the best times are when you're like not knowing. Lost. Yeah, you're lost you, and you, there's just a sense of, are we going to be in business? Mm-hmm. I mean, we went through 10 years of kind of this somewhat, you know, there's like this cloud of anxiety, like, are we going to be in business two months from now? Right. You never know when the bank's going to call your note. Or, right. you know, there's a lot of stuff we did that, uh, just kept us in business. Maybe. Well, I actually, <laughs> one of our employees had a, and, and I want to get back to kind of the, the jump off point when you started, but one of our employees told me that you famously sold a filter once to make payroll. Is that true? Is that a story? Is that yeah. a wives tale? Is that real? No, no, no. We had this, uh, we had this DE filter, uh, diatomaceous earth and um, no one liked using it because it was dirty. It's messy. It's, it's dirty. messy, and you know if it gets in your lungs, it stays in your lungs. So it was like this one thing that was like, oh, that thing. Who wants to fucking load that thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, we were having trouble meeting payroll, and it was pretty common. Um, I mean, we went, we went quite a while. Like we just couldn't pay our, we couldn't afford to pay ourselves. Mm-hmm. But we had a brewer that was, you know, he'd he'd moved here, has a wife, had a kid, and uh, like bouncing their checks sucked. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, you know, Mike and I bartended, so like we were living on, you know, <laughs> I always said between 27 and, you know, 45 bucks a day in tips. And then we, uh, alternated on, on Fridays and Saturdays because on Fridays and Saturdays, I mean, that's when we were humping that, uh, and, right. you know, it's like, we can't really afford to have waitresses because we can't afford to share the tips. <laughs> and then we, we kind of learned that balance of. Well, if we had a waitress, you know, then we would sell more beer and then we would, you know, split the tips. Right. But, um, yeah, in the early days, I mean, when you're 
run the room with just two of you. Mm -hmm. And there, there are days you'd walk out of there with, you know, seven, 800 bucks a piece. Right. It's like, that's a good day. <laughs> um, you know, when did you run When did you bump in, in to Mike? Was this a college, you know, kind of, uh, you know, oh, yeah. idea? Is that in? So I met uh, Mike Stevens my first day of college. So, um, first day of college started. Really, right? Yeah. It, it turned out to be, I showed up to college again. My parents didn't bring me to college. Uh, they were off gallivanting, doing whatever they do. And uh, anyway, my sister and oldest brother, who was just in Michigan visiting, um, they dropped me off to college, and I, apparently I was supposed to get there on Friday, and I showed up on Saturday. So I show up a day late, and um, my roommate and I don't get along very well. But um, I, I call a buddy that I went to high school with who also went to Hope, and um, we went down, had dinner together, and some dude just shows up at our table and goes, hey, there's a party at Arthur's house tonight. I'm like, who's Arthur? And he goes, it's nobody. It's just the name of the house. And he gives me the address. And so we eat, like, in 10 minutes. And I'm like, I look at my buddy, and I'm like, we're going to Arthur's. And so, like, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that party started later. Yeah. So <laughs> Show up at, like, 7 o'clock. It was 7.30. <laughs> So um, it really was. It was kind of funny because we show up, and it's just a house, right? And it's just one of those piece of shit houses that college kids live in. Mm -hmm. And we walk in, and there's, like, six dudes sitting on these couches. None of the couches have legs on them. They're all, like, stuck to the ground. The house smells like stale beer and <laughs> cigarettes and All the memories. Dip. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we walk in, and there's all these guys, like, just look at us, like, blank stares, like, are you doing here and i just go you having a party tonight and they're like uh tonight and i go you got a keg and they're like it's in the basement five bucks and I'm like, throw five bucks on the counter <laughs> i go i'll be in the basement <laughs> and so my buddy and i literally just sat in this old michigan basement like you know out of plastic cups just like drinking S seven and beers and uh this guy comes down you know one of the guys comes down to fill his cup and he goes uh, we're just upstairs watching Jeopardy if you guys want to come upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, so that's kind of how I started. And yeah. uh, I, upstairs, you know, it was Mike and actually one of my buddies who's from this area at KPAC. Okay. Um, anyway, and I got to know those guys. And back then, like, um, I had long hair and I didn't really fit, like, the conservative Hope College. You know, I was wearing flannel shirts and I always say I started the grunge movement. Because, I mean, I was the only person in my school or a handful of my friends and I always had ripped jeans and we had MEP spinners in our pocket because we'd cut school and go, go fishing and stuff. But um, anyway, that's how I kind of got to know Mike. Like, Mike would see me and he'd say, hey, by the way, we're having a party tonight or we're watching the game, you know, getting a quarter belly won't come over. So anyway, um, that was my introduction to Mike. Actually, that night when the, the police came to shut the party down, I ended up you know, all these young college kids, you know, all the freshmen just take off. Right. Like mice, you know. Did that Everyone's, a few times. And then uh, I'm like, well, everyone else is running away. I'm like, I'm going upstairs. So I ended up hiding in a closet with Mike's now wife and uh, another <laughs> another uh, guy. We we're just like hiding in this closet <laughs> waiting for the police to leave. And then, you know, when the police take off, you know, we go back downstairs and then the party continues and everyone else is left and Oh, now there's not a line for beer. So, um, yeah, so that was my introduction to Mike Stevens. And um, really, it was kind of like when we were still in school, it's like conjuring up this idea. Well, or? I was still homebrewing um, during the summers, you know, not really during college, not during, you know, while I was going to school. But, um, you know, time and time again, a, a lot of my friends were a couple years older than me. And so I was watching my friends, like, graduate, and no one was really getting jobs in, you know, the vocation that they wanted. And, like, people were doing all this other stuff. And everyone just kept saying, just do what you love, you know. And I was, you know, my parents are uh, talking to my parents' friends, and they kept saying, what are you going to do with your life? What do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm not sure. And just that, that same thing. It sounds so simple, but, you know, what do you, what do you like? What makes you happy? And I'm like, beer makes me happy. <laughs> and at the time, um, you know, the U.S. only had about 300 breweries. I was, I was actually, I was thinking about that this morning, you know, um, 
you know, on my run, at, you know, thinking about this interview, and I was like, you know, there's so many people I look up to, you know, you and founders and, and you know, other companies that have kind of paved the way. So, like, at the time, was there really, like, aspirational companies that you're like, I want to, you know, okay, I, I like this, I want to do that. Was Our, there, were there companies that were like, I like that, I want to do that? At the time, you it, were kind of getting It started. really wasn't. I mean, right. other than, like... Um, it's like a new frontier when, it you, was. when it you, was, you were there. And, like, this... We didn't. We never had aspirations of like being like a national brand or a global brand. It was really just, you know, can we make beer and sell it in our local community? I mean, maybe outside of Grand Rapids, but like, could we be a Michigan brewery? And at the mm-hmm. time, I mean, Bell's was established. Bell started brewing in '85. Um, when did you guys officially start? '97. So yeah. Bell's had almost a probably about a 10 year head start on most other breweries. There are a couple, there was one in Detroit that opened up um, that was very, very small. Um, and then there were a handful of brew pubs, you know, and there's the Frankenmuth Brewery, which was contracting a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, Stroh was st- still operational in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, there are like these pockets that start opening up. Um, there's a little brew pub that opened up, up in Lansing and um, there was a small brewery that opened up in Holland, Michigan called Rafi, which uh, is no longer. But I remember when every time you'd open up the paper and you'd say, oh, new brewery opening up here. And it's like, shit, we want to be this. You know, we want to be like the second brewery. We want to be a part of this. Right. Um, and there really wasn't a beer culture. And so, like, at, at that time, we kind of thought, well, the state of Michigan's only got room for probably two or three breweries at most. Isn't that hilarious? And, and uh, how many now? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, my God. I think we've got 40 in Kent County. Yeah. So um, anyway, but that was kind of the, the beginning. And we had aspirations of, like, can we just make beer for our local community? That was it. And this was just you and Mike. And, and how many years out of college was did, did you guys? Uh, let's see. I, I got out of college. I taught elementary school for a year. You were a teacher? Yeah. I taught elementary school uh, as an English communication major. You'd be an awesome major. teacher, dude. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking that might be. My wife keeps going. Maybe you should go back to being te- a teacher. Like uh, I don't know because I do. I enjoy getting in front of kids, and you know, it, it's one of the things that has become. Like, you have a calming presence. Really? Yeah, I always thought so. Uh, maybe it's, I think you'd be great at it. Uh, I I want to be a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we can. <laughs> we'll we'll find something. Yeah. I don't know. We've talked about it. Like, maybe we should start a, like a farm school. So I've actually. Funny you should say that. Um, I'm trying to actively hire like 10 farmers and uh-huh. I can't find a single one. There's really? no, it's impossible. It's like the, there's none of them. There's zero in the <laughs> Every, world. If, if you've driven around, everybody's hiring. <laughs> it, it's crazy, but you, yeah. And, but the thing is, is farmer as a profession, as someone who wants to do that, yeah. it's not a thing. It's like a, you either grew up in it or yeah. you get this weird affinity to want to do it and be, you know, be your own you know own your own farm well and you make that we better we better figure that out because we need farmers it's kind of important yeah (laughs) Yeah. so i actually been kicking around like this idea of of you know um uh, a trade school of sorts to like train people here Uh you know how to farm and it's like a year two-year program you know go through a couple seasons i mean yeah i've been working it out but it's like it's a huge void i cannot find farmers i mean we're willing to pay like crazy like make six figures being a farmer come. really yeah but oh. we can't but no one wants to come do you want a job yeah i don't know you got any time you got a w2 <laughs> i gotta fill out let's, yeah let's go <laughs> um um it really is interesting because I, as i don't know maybe you get when you get older and wiser you just look at life differently mm-hmm. and you, you think about you know what brings you pleasure um I don't know. I, I, I look at our industry, and I love what we've done. It's really awesome that, uh, you know, we had no idea that the craft beer industry was going to continue to grow. Um, but, you know, a few years back, like our first 10 years were difficult. You know, mm-hmm. we struggled and struggled, and we were always on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, and like I said earlier, it, it's one of those things that now you look back and you go, man, those are some of the best days because, you're like, you're just – you're just working so hard. Isn't it amazing how your brain works that way? Where I, I mean, I don't know how many times I look back in the times that I'm miserable in the current. I yeah. look back and I'm like, I love it. I love that time period. I, I think, well, about, you that, know, and you're not necessarily but, miser- miserable, but you're going through um, just a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainty. 
and you know you are kind of slumming it and i think that's part of the journey though. <laughs> yeah. that's that's part of the journey that you know because the you fight so hard and um you know we're kind of a quiet company we don't talk we don't you know we don't talk about all the struggles that we've always had but mm-hmm. um yeah i think about like when we opened up like the chicago market you know obviously as the you know millions of people and all of a sudden it's like we're in a whole different world mm-hmm. and you know it's pay to play mm-hmm. and you know our philosophy has always been you know find like the first 10 accounts that you have to be in build those relationships and you know once you hit those then then you go to the next mm-hmm. next five and it's just slow growth but it has to be organic it has to be real i stayed at the the Essen house, I think it was called, some hotel. And I'm like, I got to go down here. Our philosophy was you got to be in Chicago one day a week, at least one day a week to, to build that market up. And um, so I go down there, stay at this hotel. And were you the sales guy? Yeah. I mean, were you, you know, I, I was, how'd you and Mike, like, you know, so you started in 90, did you say 96 or 97? Uh, 97 is when we officially like started selling beer, making beer. And, and did you guys kind of divide and conquer? Like, you made the Qu- beer, he sold it. Quite you honestly. You all did it all so together. How, how did there were three of us. Mike and I, we immediately recognized that. Mike and I were both home brewers. But we recognized early on that we had to have somebody who was, like, you know, brewing on, like, you know, industrial equipment. Like, real right. commercial equipment. Not, not, you're not making beer in carboys anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different world. And uh, we hired a brewer. Um, who came highly recommended, um, really, really smart guy uh, named Rich Michaels. Uh, and Rich had been working brew pubs. He'd never packaged beer. And so um, that, that in itself became a, a challenge. Like, you can make the best beer in the world and really fuck it up trying to put it into a small package. Mm-hmm. But um, we all learned. We all cut our teeth at the same time. And so, like, we were, you know, Rich was the brewer, but we would all help. And then we had to package. And when we packaged, I mean, that meant... You know, there are days when I'm bartending, so I'm literally pouring beers for people and popping six packs and building mother cases behind the bar. Right. Because we're, we're packaging tomorrow. And then um, and there are plenty of days, like, all of a sudden, like, you're cleaning up the bar at 2 in the morning, and then you go, oh, shit, we're packaging pale ale tomorrow morning. And that's 180 cases, and each case has got four six packs. And I build it. Oh my! Yeah. It's like three o'clock in the morning. You're listening to Allman Brothers in right. the back room. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but those are the days that I, I look back at. Um, There's so much fun, and mm-hmm. like back to Chicago when we were down there, uh, I stay at this Essen house, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's, it's 125 dollars a night, and I'm like, we don't have 125 bucks. And then parking, oh, parking's $35 a night. I'm like, to park my car? You know, like, <laughs> I'm so naive about how things work. So I ended up staying at this, uh, I found a hotel called the Ohio House. That, uh, <laughs> it's right on Ohio Street, right downtown Chicago. And I'm like, it, it smells of vomit and whore. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, this, like, every time, every morning I wake up, and it just smells like disinfectant and yeah. Lysol. Bleach. Yeah, it's like I don't know if someone died in the hallway last night, but um, anyway, it was, it was fifty bucks a night, including parking, and I'm like, this this is my home. So I used, I I talked to the manager. I got a special deal. I got fifty bucks a night instead of fifty seven. <laughs> did you? Uh, I mean, you did the Tommy Boy road tripping. I mean, you you were predominantly on the road. You yeah, know, in those in those you yeah know, so formative years. Yeah, and um, you know, you had asked how Mike and I split up our time. Um, initially I helped out in the brewery and Mike, um, who is definitely more charismatic than I, um, Mike would go out and hit the road and talk to people. Um, and to Mike's credit, um, fairly early on, maybe two or three months after that, um, he came to me and said, I can't do this anymore. And he said, I don't like it. And frankly, I'm not very good at it. Um, I'm very, I'm very good at reading a room, reading people, and um, so, but I'm not, I didn't have that personality. I'm not that sure. extrovert. Sure. So I had to learn how to go out and like introduce myself and kind of sell. I, I realized also that I'm selling myself probably more than the beer because no one, yeah. no Is, one really needed the beer at the time. There wasn't really a craft beer movement. Right. It was very underground. So isn't uh, that, isn't that like, I, I just remember those are very like angsty filled days because you're trying to sell 
a product. No one know, has heard of you. No one knows of you. No one, know, and you're no trying one, to like try to sell yourself, and yeah. you feel insecure, and you're Everything like really you nervous, yeah. and these people are <laughs> judging you. You know, it's like it, I remember that just how many times I was like just tre- you know trembling, you know, getting up and doing a presentation. Oh. It's yeah, you'd walk in, I'd be in the parking lot, and I'd have to like almost excite myself. I'll go. Okay, I'm oh, going here. And, I'd do like breathing exercises yeah. in the car to calm down and be like, okay, I just got to get through this. And then I remember, <laughs> and I mean, it's those are the days, like I remember I walked into an account in Detroit and I don't know, because, you know, no one wants to see you. No one, no, I didn't, I hadn't, didn't have any established relationships with anyone. So I walked into this account and I, uh, I said, excuse me, is the, uh, my name's Dave Ingbers. I'm one of the owners of Founders Brewing Company. We're brewing Grand Rapids. Is the, the buyer here and this woman like looked at me and kind of gave me a cold stare and she goes come here and she just kind of reads me the riot act you don't come in here unsolicited Un- yeah she's like she's like you don't have an appointment she goes you look like you're unprepared <laughs> she's like you know you didn't walk in with samples i'm like well samples are in the car she goes but i don't want to wait she goes i don't want to wait for you to go back to your car to get the sample she just like, this is what you do. You do this, this, and this. And I'm like, wow, she like just totally put me in my place. But those are part of the, yeah. it's part of the learning, yeah. right? Um, and there, there are a handful of people that we can always tip our hat to. There's a, a sales guy in Grand Rapids, Frank Genovese, who really kind of taught me how to, this is how you sell. Mm-hmm. And there's some things in our industry that aren't always on the up and up. But, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes when you got to move, if you're going to go out, of, <laughs> if you're going to, if you're going to fold up shop and, and call it quits, you know, um, there are things that you got to do to, mm-hmm. to make sure that you stay in business. And so Frank taught us these are the ins and outs. And there's some people that uh, you need your product in front of and you do what you have to do. So right. we did that for a while. And then it, until you get to the business to the point where things are good. So, so you know, when when did it turn for you when things became good and, and how did that happen? Was it was it? Right time, right place. Was it you know, well, a couple? A couple things happened that were really defining for us. Is one um, the space, the the craft beer movement started growing, um, and why that, do you think it started growing? Well, because it's kind of cool. It, I mean, most people in our industry, um, when we recognized the fact that the other breweries were not necessarily our competitors, that we were all allies trying to build a movement. Um, we recognize the fact that, you know, the, the folks down at Arcadia are struggling with the same challenges that we have. Mm-hmm. And a couple of the guys from New Holland, um, Jason Spaulding and Brett Haberkamp, um, those guys went to Hope College with us. And so we knew them. Um, and also we recognize the fact that a lot of us are just we're chasing a dream mm-hmm. and we want to build something and that we're stronger together. And so... Um, we, yes, we do compete on some level, but we, we can also help each other out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the, the phrase we use is the rising tide lifts all ships. So we're trying to build a category. Um, but then at the same time, we recognized, all right, we're, there really wasn't enough, enough beer drinkers out there, craft beer drinkers. And so we had to re- figure out how can we differentiate ourselves between all these other breweries, you know, all over the state and all over, you know, all over uh, the U S. And so um, we were making some beers that were pretty pedestrian. They were pretty tame. Like yellow, yellow beers, just like well, we da- weren't, dad drinking beers. Well, we did, we did make a lager at the time founders, noble lager, which um, we tried to develop with a couple of our wholesalers and just said, you know, this is what people want. They want, you know, easy drinking, low calorie. Um, but we said, you know, those big breweries have this down. They're pretty good at that. So what can we do to differentiate ourselves? And at the time, everyone was brewing like amber ale, you know, ambers and reds were like the, those were the ticket in. They were easy to mm-hmm. transition people that were historically drinking domestic beer. So how can we create something that was like, had more flavor, but was still something that was pretty accessible. And um, we were all doing it. And so, you know, it was pretty cookie cutter. Everyone had a pale ale, everyone had an amber ale, everyone had some type of either a porter or a stout. And then everyone was trying to brew something like Oberon because Bell's Oberon was by far and away the most successful like craft beer. 
And um, we were like just ramming our heads against the wall because we were all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as home brewers, Mike and I really liked flavor. We liked bigger beers. And everyone was kind of telling us, well, there's not a market for that. And so we, we were really on the brink of bankruptcy. And we said we need to differentiate ourselves. We can't make a hoppy beer because we'd already created Centennial IPA, but no one was drinking it. I mean, at the bar, everyone was like, this beer is way too bitter. Can't drink this. And so... Um, Isn't that funny how that... Yeah, it's changed. changed. <laughs> but um, anyway, we started going through like the, uh, the BJCP, the Beer Judge Certification Program, mm -hmm. looking at different beer styles, and we're like, we knew we had to make some type of multi beer, but it had to be big and aggressive. And so we started going through it, and I'm like, we should do a, a big Scotch ale. And um, we were going to call it Fat Bastard. And um, all of a sudden, like, we talked to an attorney, and the, the attorney said, oh, it's already uh, protected by the, the Mike Myers film, uh, Austin Powers. Austin Powers. Yeah. Fat so Bastard. the name Fat Bastard was already protected. Um, that's when we started learning about. Um, uh, intellectual property. Yeah, I've gotten like four cease and assists on accident. I had no, I didn't, before I knew how to like, you know, before we had like compliance people. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have a good idea. We'd put it on a label, spend like 30 grand to get it into cans. And then I got a cease and assist from Francis Ford Coppola. Um, for which? For, um, we had a product called Archimedes, which was, um, you know, this like kind of winter, like heavy, you know, ABV, like, you know, cider. Uh-huh. Um, and they have a wine that looked, you know, similar, similar in the same name. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we're like, oh, shit. So I, I, I still have that letter in my office. I, was like, <laughs> I thought it was just kind of cool because I was like, should we not do it and just see, like, if he sends, like, a Oh, like we've a had those conversations. Head? Yeah. Like, should oh, we just? We had, should we, whole, just <laughs> we had a whole bunch of beers because we would put beers on and then we'd, we'd say, oh, we're only going to run this for one season. So if they're going to sue us, we'll just. We'll be done with it. Yeah, yeah. we'll be done. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the beer that actually changed us was um, this beer that was going to be called Fat Bastard, this big Scotch ale. And we called our attorney, and he said, it's already protected. Um, and I, we were sitting in this, uh, there was an ad agency or marketing firm, and um, we're like, oh, shit. And I'm like, I go, what if we just call it Dirty Bastard? I go, it's a Scotch ale, and say, I go, hey, you dirty bastard. <laughs> and uh, this other guy with a much better Scottish brogue started talking about eating haggis off your mammy's tit or something like that. <laughs> and um, anyway, they, uh, we all started laughing, and we called Barry, our attorney, up and said, hey, what, a, what about Dirty Bastard? And like 15 minutes later, he calls and said, Run with it. And I remember when I said it, there was kind of like a, the silence in the room, like, we can't call a beer Dirty Bastard. And I remember saying, we're going to be out of business in like two or three months anyway. I'm like, okay. fuck it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, Dirty Bastard hit, and immediately things took off. And um, So when you say it hit, I mean, you know, your distributors just liked it. There was like this cult following for it. How, how, does, well, how does that, you know, how does, I always wonder. Things change from Founders Pale Ale, Founders Red Ale, Founders Porter to Dirty Bastard. You kind of you got a little edge to you. you got a yeah. little more rock and roll. Well, just we became a little irreverent, a little bit. It's kind of like when you find your voice, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, see, so you know, like I get goosebumps just thinking about that story because yeah. it's like all of a sudden like these two young kids that you know everything we did, like we had to run everything through our board or, or our investors, I guess at the time, and all of a sudden I was like, fuck it. Like, we're going to run our own business. We're not going to listen to other people. When, when someone tells you you can't do something, you know, it makes you work a little harder. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, it's like we had Founders Dirty Bastard, and it just felt real. Do you feel like up until that point, you were a little more concerned about, you know, call it the investors in the room? or oh, yeah. Or trying to, you know, you weren't, you were trying to kind of well, placate I mean, them more than maybe, you know, what your, well, we had, what you your know, vision we had, was telling you? You know, we had, we had taken friends and family's money I mean you have to, to chase right? our to dream start. yeah yeah and like you know you think back I mean we had neither Mike nor I had ever worked in a brewery or a brew pub neither one of us had ever taken a business class I mean it <laughs> makes the best business people but, sometimes but the the economy was strong you know and you know banks were willing to loan 
people hundreds of thousands of dollars as well, you know, as long as it's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had some, we had some investors that were, you know, pretty well off. And so it wasn't a huge investment. Like no one made, I think the biggest investor at the time maybe had invested 30,000. But I, I look back at all the pitfalls because we had said, oh, we can't make payroll or we can't afford to buy bottles right now. So if we just had like $15,000 more, we would be able to do this, this, this. And then we'd be like over the hump when the reality was we probably needed 500,000, you know, (laughs) because then we'd have to like three months later, we'd have to write another letter. And, um, but those were the challenges, but most importantly, um, you know, all of a sudden we found our voice and all of a sudden it was like, Oh, now we've got founders dirty bastard. And you know, the, our wholesalers at the time, we probably only had two or three wholesalers, but like wholesalers started calling us. Like we started getting calls like from distributors in Chicago. Like it made enough ripple effect that people are like, Hey, I keep hearing about this. I hear about this. Yeah. And that gave such a good feeling. Yeah. And all of a sudden (laughs) that gave us the, the confidence to like, I remember, um, there's like four of us that sat in the table in our tap room and we just said, all right, we're going to brew a beer that we want to drink. And like Amber Ale was our number two. I think Pale was number one. Amber was number two. And we literally just sat around the table and said, who drinks Amber? And everyone's like, fuck it. I don't drink Amber Ale. I don't like it. And we're like, why are we brewing beer that we don't like? And so we're like, it's done. 86 it. And so it gave us the confidence, like, to start experimenting with chocolates and coffee. Um, you know, we, I think we'd already been playing around with stuff in our tap room. But we're like, why don't we take, uh, we had a beer called Kentucky Breakfast Stout. And we're like, why don't we put this in package? Why don't we put this in a bottle? And all of a sudden, you know, we decided to become essentially a product-driven company and say, Better ingredients make better beer. If it costs more to make, we'll charge more. And so right. K- KBS was actually like the first beer that was, you know, was nineteen dollars a four pack. Yeah, when I could, when I first like you know could buy beer, yeah. I I would remember that release and there'd be lines out. I mean, I don't see that anymore for any products in the industry, but it, the, I, yeah, for, the industry's for, for changed like, now. It's changed, but I just I I I vividly remember. I'm like, what's everyone doing? It's like it's KBS release. Yeah, oh, yeah CBS yeah. release. Well, like, all of us, shit. a lot of us, <laughs> that's insane. A lot for of us beer, that were in the yeah. game at that at that point. I mean, you kind of you create events mm-hmm. like. Uh, our friends down at Three Floyds down in Indiana, they had Dark Lord Day, and they would release this one beer. And what was so great about it was it was the community of beer enthusiasts was growing. And so these, these you know, this affectionate term, you know, beer geeks, they would make a, a trip to, like, these breweries for these single beer releases. And what's so great is these beers that are, like, so highly rated, you know, Beer Advocate, Rate Beer, those things were starting to pop up. The Internet was all new, but all of a sudden we kind of found a voice. Like, these are the people that love what we do. Not just, they don't, there also isn't a ton of brand loyalty. So they don't just love founders. They love Stone. They love Dogfish. You know, they love. I mean, and and that really was, I mean, you guys were all kind of rising tides at the same time. I mean, yeah, it, we we're it, all kind of coming up. Yeah, right. And it was interesting. I mean, you look at the, the map of the United States, it's, you know, stone out in California, you know, even though like Sierra Nevada had been growing since the, the early 80s, you know, all of a sudden these little pockets started opening up and Russian River and uh, the beer community started getting very vocal. And it was kind of fun. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, we just kind of, found our own voice. We became product driven. Um, and I'd say that the day that we r- really recognized that we were different was uh, we got invited to the Extreme Beer Fest. And it's a festival that the, the folks at Beer Advocate out in Boston put on. And it's invite only. And it's predominantly, I think about, I think it was 30 different breweries. And uh, a lot of them from the East Coast. But um, it was, it was kind of like the rock stars of the brewing industry. And um, we, we went out there, and uh, a friend of ours now, but um, the night before the, the festival, all the brewers get together for, like, a dinner at a, at a local bar. And I remember, like, walking in, like, just typical Midwesterners, you know, flannel shirt, and we walk into this place, and 
I'm standing there, like, trying to get a beer at the bar, and, you know, not being aggressive, just kind of standing there, and all of a sudden, like, someone pushes me, like, from the back, and being Midwestern, I go, I'm sorry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then I get a second push, and I turn around now, it's like, all right, what's going to happen here? So it's like, are we going to throw down, or... And it's um, Adam Avery from Avery Brewing Company out in Colorado. And he goes, you the founders, guys? I go, yeah. And he goes, you guys just set the bar really fucking high. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks. Cool. <laughs> and I didn't really know because apparently he'd already seen, like, the lineup of all the beers. So right. um, we'd already created, like, a whole bunch of beers. Like, when we took the gloves off, we were like, we can, you know, there's no rules. We're just going to brew whatever we want. And um, so at the Extreme Beer Fest, we brought, I didn't realize it, but most people brought one or two beers. Well, we brought 12. So, you know, we, we were one of the first breweries to do this, like, time tapping thing. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, we had it down. So, like, we would have, like, you know, a four beer tap and three beers were, stayed on all day. But every half hour, every hour, we tap a new beer. And so that meant, you know, they were all the big beers. They were the show-off beers. And so, like, every hour there'd be a line of people. And then, you know, when that tap runs out, you know, you wait till the next hour, and all of a sudden you tap another one, bam, you got another line of people. And so the, the Extreme Beer Fest, I don't remember what year it was, but, um, I mean, there was a line of people at, that went literally across the room the entire time. And uh, it was a two-session fest uh, so between the first session, second session, there's already, you know, a thousand people waiting to get in line. And so at the second session, all the brewers were surrounding this little booth of, of you know, Founders Brewing Company that no one had ever heard of. Like, so here's, you know, the cats from like Russian River and Stone and mm -hmm. Dogfish and all these, you know, breweries that were like, these guys are, they make such great liquid. And they're all like, who the fuck are you guys? We've never even heard of you guys. So when the second session opened up, you know, all the folks that just took off, everyone's like, where do, you, where do we have to go? Where do you have to go? And everyone's like, founders, founders. The second session was almost weird. There's 30 breweries, and, like, everyone has, like, four or five people, and there's, there's 500 people, like, in line at Founders. It was... Yeah. I, were, I, you, were you working the festival? Were you there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, not... <laughs> We didn't even have distribution. That's what I was going to say. So like, like, it was still early. Yeah, yeah. We, we couldn't even drive through Canada. We had to take the long ride because we had, you know, kegs in the back of our car. <laughs> um, anyway, but we, we left there. Uh, it was Mike, myself, and uh, a guy who had done some marketing for us. And we are like, holy shit. Like, instantly. That was we, different. We are like, we had no idea how different we were. And, like... It was a game changer. It was like, all right, like there, there's certain things that we're really good at. When you see the momentum, we don't hesitate. It's like when you when the windows open, you go, you go, yeah, and you don't you don't talk about it. You just fucking do it. Mm -hmm. um, and but it was a different time too. Now I mean now we look at stuff and we're like, oh, we got to run a survey. We're gonna do analytics on this. We're gonna yeah. I mean, th don't you feel at the time you were coming up, there was a lot of freedom to kind of be. I don't want to say like a cowboy with it, but you're able to. Kind were. Of, everything yeah, was, like everything every, was rogue. Everything everything's was rogue and everything's gut and everything's like now's the time. And I feel like now, you know, um, maybe it's the industry. Maybe it, maybe, it, you know, things are much more calculated. When you become a bigger business. Th that too. It drives me nuts yeah. because I, I was talking to someone yesterday. I said, you know, we used to go out and feel the market we'd listen to people you talk to people and now i go now we sit here and look at i got three monitors in front of my desk and right. it's like what do we do here i don't know what, what is this happening and yeah. you're getting you know instant messaging from somebody else and, and it's like i'm like does anyone just go out in the fucking store anymore and just yeah. live it because that's this is where the rubber hits the road what are your top three favorite um founders beers you've ever made you have you have any loyal loyal I don't know. I mean, I always say our beers are like our kids. You don't love any one more than the other. But um, no, I mean, you appreciate all the different nuances of every beer. So mm -hmm. Harvest Ale is one of my favorite beers um, because it's just, it's, it's fresh hopped. And a lot of us that work at the, at the brewery, that's, you know, our, our rule is, you know, if Harvest is on tap, that's all you drink. I like that. It's, it's just, it's, it's great when it's fresh. 
Um, we have another beer that historically has done extremely well with beer enthusiasts. Uh, we've struggled a little bit keeping it shelf stable, but a beer called Red's Rye. It's an IPA. It's my favorite. With that, rye malt. That's my favorite beer. Yeah. So beer that's uh, for sure. And it was interesting because when we when we released it, um, and it's still I think our number one selling beer at the tap room because of all our employees, we all drink it. Um, but it was when we first noticed people, other brewers would come over and go, "Man, fresh Red's Rye is like the, my favorite beer." And no, you know, we'd also hear people say, oh, I love Centennial, or I love your blah, blah, blah. But it's the only time it kept coming up. Fresh Red's Rye. Fresh blah, blah. Red's Rye. You're and like, it was like, what you, what, what's going on back here? Backhanded compliment. Yeah. And uh, one, of our, one of our cats, uh, Bobby Kaiser, one of my favorite people in the world, he said, uh, Red's Rye is the best beer I've ever had, and it's the worst beer I've ever had. Like an old <laughs> yeah. Red's Rye is terrible. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, those, those two... And, um, you know, we just released a beer called Unraveled, which is uh, 6.6%. Just we use cryo hops. It's just got so many aromatics, and it's, you know, still fairly low in ABV. Mm-hmm. It just that 6.5% is just kind of, it's my sweet spot. Yeah. Um, as I get older, I used to relish, like, the big, big, crunchy beers. Um, and I still love them, but I tend to, thank you. Um, but the, the reality is, you know, I got four kids. I'm a dad. Yeah. Um, it's got a really nice nose on it. Thank you. Like, really nice. Thank you. We do all right here out in the, yeah. out in the country. Um, anyway, so we, we released Unraveled, like, a month before COVID hit. And I, I feel so terrible. I mean, almost like a kid, like, Here's this phenomenal beer, and we launch it at never the, got the, its, yeah the worst time to, to yeah, do any activation never, anything like that yeah we weren't able to go out on premise do tastings just I mean part of what we do here is get liquid to lips yeah and um, we lost that opportunity um, but the liquid's just so delicious that I love the, our packaging our, our our marketing team just did a killer job on the the packaging um, and it's different you know so we have and obviously all day IPA is you know the the beer that really took off for us. It, I mean, I mean, you know, there were multiple. You said, you know, when you when when you launched Dirty Bastard, that was one kind of, you know, leaving the the atis, atmosphere. And then, you know, would you say all day was kind of when you left the next? You know, well, kind of went I mean, to the next. There's always beers in between, like yeah. Breakfast Out, Breakfast and That's KBS. Yeah, I mean, KBS go. kind of I don't, almost defined us. It yeah, it made to me that was the the beer that took us to like that. Yeah, that sounds pretentious, but kind of took us to that rock star level. Mm-hmm. Um, and doing, but it, it's it's more than the liquid. It's it's the events. Everything everything has to be hitting on at the same time. Kind of like it's a symphony working. It's like the you know it's kind of like I always look at products that we've had that are really successful. It's like you hit on so many fronts that like everything it, has to happen. It, it just kind of right connects. Time. The, the packaging know? has yeah. to be right. It has to be released at the right time of the year distributors have to be ready for it yeah it has to yeah distributors the pricing the package is it a four pack it's a six pack is it does it Mm -hmm. come in bombers you know um and all those things have to hit at the same time but kbs you know really turned into like this phenomenon where the the last time we we launched kbs on a single day used to be a single day release which was awesome like we would sell it out in one day and we had we had People flying in from um, from Australia, from you know uh, Vancouver, because we always ask people when they come to pick it up. It's like, oh, well, you you can only buy you know two four packs of it. Mm-hmm. It was so limited, and so it made an event. But was so great, um, like like all these events, these beer enthusiasts would come. They would you know they're bringing their their bottles that were. Um, you know, from, from California and these beers that are so coveted. And then they would, like, sit in line with people that they don't know. And like, share. And just share. Yeah. And go, hey, we're all here for the same reason, yeah. you know. That's, a, see, again, more yeah. goosebumps. Cause it's yeah, like, I got the chills there, too. I, just, I think about, you know, when I first, when I, you know, got on the scene a little bit later, um, you know, that was one of the things I really liked about it because it was just very connective. But know, yeah, just, and that's, yeah, I love that. That's the community of beer. Mm-hmm. And quite honestly, you know, that's why I talk about it. Like, I love beer, but what really got me into beer was how it connected people. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I was, I, I think back, I was 17 years old and I went to England for my first time and um, seeing the pub culture. And it was much different because I'm not into sports. Right. I'm not a sports guy. And so, like, when I think of bars in the United States, it was a bunch of people looking at big screen TVs, not, just, right. not talking to each other. Right. And so, like, when we opened our tap room, intentionally we didn't put a TV in there. It was really just about bringing people together. And I remember this was back in the days where, you know, you're not streaming anything. So we literally would bring our music in on CDs. I had my, my CD collection behind the bar. And, you know, you'd sit there and say, what do you guys want to listen to? You want to listen to Simon Garfunkel? You want to listen to The Dead? And we were just spinning music. And usually, you know, it's just like walking into a restroom. Like one guy would sit at, you know, at this stool and then like two stools empty and then the next yeah. person. And so my job was to create connection. And so I would try to engage these people and try to get them to talk. And sometimes they, they were like, pushing back so then i'd go you know i go fucking john lennon i'm like i think he's one of the worst songwriters ever and then i'd go back i'd like open the door <laughs> to like change a keg or something like that and i'd come back and they're like what the hell did you say yeah. and all of a sudden they're like talking they're, they're, yell, they're yelling at what an idiot i am <laughs> and, then, and then i'm That's like awesome. i'm like oh i'm like you guys meet each other and they're like yeah, you're a fucking idiot, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, also I'm like, I'm just fucking with you. I just wanted to make sure that you guys <laughs> could talk, to, could each talk to each other. Yeah. You just create those connections, you know. Well, I think that's what, you know, I always said for, like, us, it's like, you know, we're in the business of making memories, you know. You know, our tagline for, you know, Blake's is, you know, making memories is always in season. And, cool. you know, and I always kind of thought, like, you know, I look at that through food, beverage, you know, entertainment. Yeah. And we're really just trying to create, you know, be a conduit for that. And yeah. I think that that's what beer does. I think that that's what the industry is, has been about for a long time. Um, and I hope it continues to be, um, you know, one of the things I've always admired about you and founders in general, one, like just the culture you guys have, I haven't met a person from founders that, you know, that I've come across that isn't just a good, cool person. And, you know, I guess I'm curious and I, you know, people I talk to say you're the reason for that. So how do you, how do you grow and kind of keep a culture? And how did you struggle with that? And you know, and I, think it's, and, and, and I know you take it personally and you take it seriously. And yeah, but it, I think you've done such a good job. And and I know at certain points as you get big, it becomes. I'm feeling it now. It, it becomes harder. You know? Yeah, I think uh, initially it was just very organic. Mm -hmm. I mean, like almost all our employees were either customers or they're they're just like friends, yeah, right? Right. Um, and it just happened very naturally. Um, and especially when, you were, when we were smaller, like everyone had this goal. Everyone knew. Everyone knew we were struggling. Mm -hmm. And everyone knew you could just sense it, like, you know, when, when paychecks bounce. And people knew, like, when we weren't taking paychecks. It's like, we have to do this. Right. Uh, how do you make it work? So there was just that constant struggle. So, like, and everyone had this common goal. What can we do to make sure that this thing continues to work? Um, so, like, you just end up organically, like, hiring cool people because we all, everyone wants to be a part of it. It's like mm -hmm. when you s see someone struggling, it's like, hey, if we all help, maybe this thing can actually continue. Right. Um, and it, it has been a huge struggle. Like, as we, I mean, we, you know, what, 2007, we had 16 employees. So that In 2007? Yeah. It seems like yesterday. Yeah, that's 2007, so we had, that's when we moved from our first facility to our current facility um and how many and how many do you have today 600 so that's insane i know it's just like <laughs> um when we opened up our new facility we i think we went from 16 to like 40 because our tap room you know tripled in size uh maybe doubled in size at the time but now it's gotten bigger um but you know all of a sudden we recognized i mean for a while i was still the sales department and um, you know, all of a sudden you realize we can't keep doing this. One year, I'm getting burned out. Right. Um, and so you can't just live this life. I mean, not like we're rock stars, but you live on the road, eating terrible food. You're treating your body. And, Awful. And yeah, you're yeah. like, every, every night you're like staying up till two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then every weekend you're doing a festival, you're doing something, and you're constantly pounding beers. Back then I was smoking and 
doing other stuff and <laughs> you just live this lifestyle. You're like, this, this yeah. isn't sustainable. Yeah. And, um, that's, I, I felt, I felt myself go through that maturation too. It's like, it was great for a time and it's like, okay. Well, it's a lifestyle, you know? And I think there's, there are people in our industry that it, this is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then we, you get to a point and all of a sudden, like you turn around and you're like, now I've got all these people that depend on us and they need, you know, they have, they're having families and they need benefits and they need insurance. And, um, all of a sudden it's like, if this thing goes down, you know, like if we went out of business and Mike and I went out, you know, we lost our houses and, you know, shame that's on one us. Thing, right? That's one thing. But when you've got all these people yeah. and it's like that, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. It's like, all right. So the, so then all of a sudden we're like, this is a business. So we like assembled the team. We were very strategic and said, we need a CFO. We need, we need to sit down. And we actually met with like a business manager. And um, I remember he, uh, he made a comment to me that just hit home. And like he was going over all of our books and we were like using like Microsoft QuickBooks or whatever. And he, all of a sudden he goes, yeah, you guys have a really expensive hobby. And he goes, you need you need to run a business. And all of a sudden we, you know, all of a sudden I realized I don't have to be up until three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be the last guy at the bar. I don't have to do shots. I'm like, I, I, I realized I can actually go out, have fun. I can be in bed by 11 or midnight, but I certainly don't have to be up until two. And I can also like, and everyone else is partying and being stupid having fun but being stupid mm -hmm. i'll be the guy who has a meeting at 8 30 the next morning and i've got i've got the wholesaler's attention right so all of a sudden you go yeah you know what there's a i can use this to my advantage because right. everyone else is they're younger than i am they're playing hard right they want to be the rock stars right. i don't want to be a rock star i want to sell more beer right <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah you, you matured in, in that sense i always felt that you um you know, you and um, the whole group um, over at Founders, you know, you've, you've handled success very well. You know, you're super humble people and just amazing. And, you know, other people, uh, you know, certain people who hit the level of success you have. I mean, you guys are what, one of the what, top? I think, uh, we're, uh, I think we're the 13th bigger. the largest brewery in yeah. the US. Yeah, I mean, so. I mean, including, you know, Anheuser-Busch. Yeah, I mean, that's insane. That's yeah. absolutely insane. And, like, that could really go to someone's head. But then I like talk to you and I, and I hang with you and I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? Because I think that that's like one of the most redeeming, you know, qualities in anyone is to kind of not, you know, be too full of their own shit, you know, yeah. a little bit, no matter how, how, how awesome well, you know, I, what, what you're a part of. I don't know. The question I get often is like, when did you know you were successful? Yeah. And quite honestly, I mean, your level of success is it's, it's in your head. So yeah. but to me, the, First time I knew that we were successful, <laughs> sounds so silly, but um, I was filling my gas, uh, filling my car, and I remember like putting the gas pump in and letting it fly, because I, I used to have to call <laughs> the bank, and I'd, my bank account would say, you got you know, $13.72, and like I'd put t 10 bucks in. <laughs> Always have a buffer, and um, the first time I ever like just let it fly, and I'm like, I just put... Thirty dollars of gas and fucking shop. made it. Dude. I just remember. I, I honestly, I remember. I'm like, holy shit, this thing's gonna be all right. But you know, I think we all go through times. Mm -hmm. That that one time at the gas pump was kind of that time that I just thought everything's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I live my life. You know, we only go around once. You know, don't be a dick. Um, treat everyone respond. You know, equally. Um, just treat people the way you want to be treated, and you know, things should turn out. I mean, that hopefully attracts people to work at our company mm -hmm. and let people be themselves. I mean, we used to call ourselves like the Island of Misfit Toys because we're all a little quirky. Everyone's different. And, you know, so-and-so's got dreadlocks and, you know, so-and-so likes to skip, you know, whatever. But it's just like everyone's different, but everyone, that's kind of what makes the world awesome, that mm -hmm. we're not a bunch of droids and we don't dress the same, look the same, talk the same, listen to the same music, like the same food. You know, that's what makes the world great is everyone's different and you just embrace that. You know? Do you, um, you know, do, do, you have, do you have anything you would have done differently, you know, when you look back at the journey so far? Yeah, I um, definitely. I mean, there's definitely 
things that we could have done differently, um, I would have celebrated a lot more. Like, yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we've done some miraculous things. I mean, really, we're, I mean, like you said, we went from a brewery that brewed 6,000 barrels to 600,000 barrels in 10 years. Mm -hmm. But it's like when you're going around the track and you got the accelerator down, you don't really yeah, celebrate. Blinders on, right? It's, it's just, just like, like next thing, next thing, yeah, next thing. Yeah, what can we keep doing? What can yeah. we keep doing? That's how I feel. And That's where we're, like, we're at right now. And not that it's on this, you know, not making comparison, but you do notice yourself. You just like, you, don't, you, have to, you, don't, you don't step out. You have to. You have to take a step back and, and go, holy shit. Yeah. This is amazing. And, and really relish like the people around you. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the thing I struggle with the most is as we've grown, um, you know, we went from, you know, 16 employees to 600 employees. Um, it drives me nuts that I don't know everyone's name. Mm -hmm. Like I walk, I used to say like I'd walk through, I didn't even know their names because everyone had nicknames. Mm -hmm. and so it's like, You'd walk in and talk about, hey, there's sparkles and, and there's, there's brown over there and there's dode. And I don't know, just everyone had nicknames. And uh, some people I didn't even, I never knew their names. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just having beers with a buddy of mine named Huggy Bear. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Huggy. Starsky uh, and Hutch, dude. That, uh, that, that, that. Yeah, I mean, we all have them, right? Yeah, yeah we have people in that are in our lives, but Huggy Bear call them huggy because he hugs you yeah and they were like those real like you know real hugs that yeah. like hug you to the spine and uh anyway um <laughs> i remember i got a call and it's like i gotta pick up my son I go, uh, who's your son he's like, mark and i'm like i don't know a mark we don't have a mark here he works in the deli i'm like i don't know of a mark and i go could he go by anything else and finally he's like dancing around and he goes Check Huggy. I go, Huggy Bear? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. I go, I was just talking to him. Do you, um, you know, being who you are and kind of where you come from and just kind of the, the, the person you are, does part of you, you know, struggle with success or kind of, uh, I, uh, uh, or I don't want to say I hate it, but, but like but resent it a little bit because it kind of forces you to think, um, I'm speaking for you a little bit, but, you know, you, you seem like, you know, um, a go with the flow very like in the, in the moment and appreciative of, of and when you get so big and you're in charge of such a large enterprise like you have to kind of put on different hats that maybe aren't aren't, aren't natural or uh, or are different and so I mean do you struggle with that a little I bit I do or? but I'm ultimately just it? comfortable in my skin yeah so like I'm comfortable like you know if you have to go to a fundraiser and stuff like that you know like, you know, obviously you know I've got a beard and I've got a couple suits and stuff like that. And you have, sometimes you have to go and there's a bunch of bankers and yeah. accountants. And I don't know. I think everyone wishes um, that they could just be themselves. Yeah. And that's the, I'm pretty comfortable being myself and I don't have to, you know, I don't have to apologize. You know, I can be appropriate in, in, the, <laughs> in the right situation, but right. Um, I'm really comfortable being who I am. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I am, I don't want to say reluctant, but sometimes, like, you don't want, as we get big, people kind of assume that you're a certain way because you got a big business and, mm -hmm. you know, people say, oh, you guys are so huge and blah, blah, blah. But I, I, I honestly kind of think of a, when I think of founders, I think of our first 10 years. Right. I kind of, I, I think of the struggle. That's where my head is. Right. And I'm always, and not to say that I'm not always looking to get, to grow because I think that's the future. Obviously, as a business person, that's what you're constantly looking at. And I'm not thinking of it from a financial standpoint. I'm thinking of it because I absolutely love what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, again, so, and, and this is like anyone who has a consumer good. Hopefully, you're doing this because you make a phenomenal product and you want to share it. Mm -hmm. So it, it has like zero financial impact. I, I look at the things and think, wouldn't it be great if everyone could drink our beer and just go, holy shit, this is the best. This is my favorite or one of my favorite IPAs or this is one of my favorite stouts. Um, just like, it's like when you're cooking in the kitchen, you know, you're entertaining and someone goes, you know, when someone gives you that look and goes, what's in this? This is awesome. That's what I love. I love yeah. that little yeah. spark when people go, what is, there's a spice in here that I can't identify. And you're like, yeah, that's what it is. So, so, you know, 
that being said, you know, what's, what's next? I know, you know, the, the, the landscapes evolved, yeah. right? Um, people who used to be, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to blame it on seltzers. Um, I won't, but it feels like the lines as the times change and people change and tastes change. It does feel like, you know, everything's being blended, right? There's no longer beer and wine and cider. It's kind of like, there's like this beyond beer category and there's this, you know, infused, you know, kind of category. And how do you, how do you look at that changing landscape and say, well, we're, you know, we're one of the 13 largest breweries in the world. You know, do you, do you keep an eye on those trends on the outside? How do you, you how do you keep your, how do you keep your true North and kind of think about the next evolution? It's like, you know, you and I talked about it and I always loved that you, that you said it that way. You know, you were talking about like being a band and it's like, how do you, yeah, you're like, you know, you know, the biggest band, you know, one of the biggest bands, you know, currently, and how do you stay relevant and how do you kind of continue to you have evolve? To. And certain bands do it well and they, they last the test of time and other ones are like, you know, they were there, you know, they're there and then, you know, they don't, they don't evolve. So, you know, when you said that, I was, I was given a lot of thought about our evolution and things yeah. that, that we might do. And, you know, are we a beverage company? Are we a cider company? Do we just, you know, take out Angry Orchard, you know, is that the, is that the goal? Is it beyond yeah. that? So I, I think about that a lot when, I, you, when you said that to me, but I don't know. how do you I, think about I, it? I look at it and I'm like, you know what, beer's been around for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we've, we've been playing in this game for, you know, close to 25 years and we've, we've watched these trends. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I do, I do think, you know, stick to what you're really, really good at, but you have to, you can't, you can't avoid trends. You have to at least acknowledge them. Um, and even within the beer category, like for years, we were like, you know, we're not coming out with a hazy, you know. Yeah. It's essentially a flawed beer. Um, and we're like, why would we come out with a flawed beer? But at a certain point, you go, well, you look at the trends and the kids are into it. Kids are into <laughs> it. And it's like, all right, give the people what they want yeah. to, to quote Mr. Ray Davies from the Kinks. Yeah. And, um, you know, sometimes right. it's like, all right, if that's what you want. If we're gonna make if we're gonna make a flood beer, we're gonna make, make a, a really damn fucking good, good one. <laughs> um, but I, I do look at it and look at trends, and um, you know sometimes you can just go, you know what, that these are gonna happen, and you just have to kind of navigate around them. Right. Um, but beer and cider have been around for a really really long time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean cider was a bigger category than beer. For I don't know when beer became larger than cider. I'm working on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what um, I think that's a good place to, to end it. But I, I am curious. You know, when you look out at the horizon now, who do you who do you look who are you impressed by in the industry in the alcohol industry? Sounds bad, but I don't, don't pay attention. I don't pay attention. <laughs> I really don't because um, and this is I, I talked to one of our. It's cat, a good thing. I, I talked to one of our cats years ago, and he asked me a similar question, and I said, you know, I said sometimes. If, I, if I'm watching what everyone else is doing, I'm not doing anything original. And so um, that's when we find success, is when you innovate. And um, that's what I, you know, I was talking to some of the folks on our team, too, because we're constantly looking at trends. Oh, this, this category is coming up, and this category this category's down, but it's you know, on the brink of summer. When summer hits, it's going to come up again. And I'm like, why don't we just focus on what, we're, what we do? not worry about things that are out of our control so if if we just stay true to who we are you know if i'm constantly worried about what other breweries are coming up with it's going to change it's going to influence potentially what we do and i don't want i don't want that to happen i want to just do what feels right um and i i love the idea of innovating creating something that hasn't been done and that's what i you know i talked to some of our our finance folks, because they're constantly looking at trends and our analysts, and they're like, "Oh, this is doing this, this is doing that." I'm like, "I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, let's just do what we do mm-hmm. and do it better than everyone else," you know. And it it is, a, you know, that brings up another point that also, oftentimes, especially in our, the world that we live in, in social media, it's always like, "What what what what's the best IPA?" There's all these contests. Who's the best? I'm like, it's, it's not about who's the best. It's like, you know, you and I talk about music a lot. Um, it's like there's times when you want to listen, you know, on the way down, we, we listen to a lot of Motown. And yeah. then, then my, my son's like, can we listen to Peter Frampton? And I'm like, 
that's a cool nine year old. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, and then they want to listen to Ariana Grande, or, and you know, that's the thing. There's no. It, it's like the moment that you're in. That's what you want. Right. And so, like, I people say, "Oh, who makes the best, who's the best brewery?" I'm like, yeah. "Who cares? It's not about who's the best." But just like appreciate all the breweries for everything they do. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on. I I, I truly believe you're the greatest guy in beer, and um, you know, uh, look forward to seeing what you and the founders crew continue to do. And I'm looking forward to um, launching Blake's North with you uh, uh, up in northern Michigan. Amy just gave me. She goes. She goes. We should buy a farm in northern Michigan. I'm like, all right. I'm, I'm looking. Let's do it. Yeah. I I can help. We can try to figure out this farm academy thing because. I, yeah. I honestly love that idea. Amy and I, we, there's 80 acres in the West Michigan area that I'm looking at. That's, and like our kids go to like some environmental schools and stuff like that. And we, uh, it's something that we've talked about. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to see another development. I don't want to see I'm another so, neighborhood. I'm like, I want, I found this Chicago. I'm so done with the suburban sprawl. I yeah. like, I, 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 I'm with you. I, I'm next, with you. Next time you're in Grand Rapids, uh, I don't know if we're still recording, but next time you're in Grand Rapids, like I already met the guy that owns it. He's an eighty four year old postal worker. And I said, I don't want a neighborhood. I don't want to see three cul de sacs. Right. And I'm like, I'll buy your farm and I'm like, I will convert this to a like a learning school, like a working school where kids can come and milk cows and raise chickens and let's do it, man. Yeah. All right. That's perfect. We're partnering. You heard it here first. All right. <laughs> cheers. All right, cheers. Thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. You can find everything borrowed on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Show your support and drop a five-star review to help more people find our channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Stay up to date with us on Facebook, Instagram, and everythingborrowedpodcast.com. EBP is produced by Chelsea Cox, Jason Brown, and Vox Adams. Edited and filmed by Nick Ferguson. Art is by Adam Yarborough. Everything Borrowed is an After Hours Media production. Copyright 2021.